Good morning, welcome to the CABE webinar Wednesday for the 16th of June. Today we're looking at a review of the new Part L1A with Andy Mitchell. Those of you who don't know, my name is Jordan and I'm the Regional and Student Services Coordinator here at CABE and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. We do like to make these interactive and Andy is happy to take any questions at the end of his presentation. So please do send in, a, in any questions that you may have. You can do these through a variety of ways. You can send them in via the questions tab that will be appearing on your screen if you're joining us live today. If you're catching up with us on YouTube, then please do email any through to webinars at cbuildy.com or you can tweet us using the hashtag CABECPD. As I've already mentioned, your presenter today is Andy Mitchell. Andy is the Director of Energy Services at Stroma. So Andy leads Stroma's dynamic energy team, providing best in-class energy calculations and assessments for the wider construction industry. Andy's team provided energy assessment services for the prestigious New Cranes Court Scheme in Basildon, Essex, which was awarded Sustainable Larger Housing Project of the Year. It achieved CSH Level 6 as one of the largest zero carbon projects in the Thames Gateway. Led by Andy, Stroma's energy team have completed over 13,000 assessments on an array of projects. And for Stroma's little intro, so Stroma is the market leader in building safety, environmental sustainability and building compliance services to the construction industry. Their first class team deliver testing, consultancy and environmental monitoring services from pre-planning pre to final handover and beyond. They work collaboratively throughout the supply chain to deliver services to their clients, which support them before, between and beyond construction. By engaging with their clients during the whole construction life cycle, they can help to achieve better asset management, transparency of data and supply chain collaboration. I'm just going to hand over to Andy now and he can take you through his presentation. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for that, Jordan. I assume you can all hear me. Yep, we can right. hear you and see your screen. Brilliant. That's good news. That's a good start, isn't it? Um, yeah, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I've done this a few times, so I do apologise if I've, I've caught any of you in an area of presentations before, or um, I, I drift off into sort of random chats. But um, basically, what I'm going to talk about is the new Partel is coming. Um, there's there was a documentation called the Future Home Standard, which was released a long time ago. It seems now it was in um, January 2020. And they took a, an, almost a year to respond to it. Okay, obviously due to COVID and other things as well, and possibly arguments of um, the government being somewhat disorganised. Um, so this really refers to that document, the, the response to the consultation for the future home standard. There is some other documentation which is out there at the moment, which the consultations um, are just about to close or have no, they have closed. Um, and there's another similar document called the Future Building Standard. Now that covers mainly commercial, so I'm not touching on that completely today, but there is some elements and cross-referencing which I will refer to as I go through the presentation. Okay, so what we're talking about. So it's due Partel. So Partel hasn't been updated for a considerable number of years. Um, eight, nine years, we haven't really had an uplift in Partel. Um, and it is somewhat out of date. Um, to sort of the general agenda which we need to push forward. So what the consultation asked for originally was what level of carbon uplift do we need to deliver in New Partel? And they've um, catchily called the document Partel 1A 2021. Um, the two headline figures was an uplift of 20% of carbon an improvement of 20% or an uplift to 31%. And the government have gone for a 31% uplift, which is, wasn't a massive surprise, so they're going for the higher standard. So it just makes everything somewhat more challenging. There is a, there's gonna be a new transitional process. The, the, the transitional process is how we step from one version, the, the current version of Partel, into the new version of Partel, this new document, how we do that. 
And that's going to be done by building rather than a site-wide strategy. Now, that's quite crucial to how we deliver this position. And I've got a slide on that in a minute. The three compliance matrix, the ones that are going to demonstrate that you're building your new home is going to be compliant, um, uh, is going to be energy, which is new. Okay, we've not really concentrated on the energy number before. Carbon still there, which for obvious reasons, because we're quite interested in what the carbon emissions are. And fabric energy efficiency is there. Now I've put that in bold, only mainly to remind myself, but it wasn't originally within the first consultation and the responses against it were, you know, we need to we need to get some fabric matrix back in there. And I, I personally think that's a sensible statement um, and I'll, I'll reference why that is in a minute. Now it looks like all of this, what I talked to you about this morning, um, will come into play from June 2022. So we've got a year. Okay. So this will be, that will be the drop dead date. It will come in in that position. Okay. So the documents themselves haven't been released yet. Um, we're suspecting them to, they promised they would come out in December this year. So the actual full Partel documents and the other ones in this other consultation, the future building standards are in theory supposed to catch up so that all these raft of additions to Part L1A and Part L1B, so the commercial document, should come out in December. But we're waiting to see whether that's happened. Promises hasn't been met before. Okay, um, and uh, just a little note down there, just so everyone's aware, um, and also to remind myself again to, to mention it, the government is still going to allow flexibility from the planners to up the standard. So we see that at the moment. We do energy reports, et cetera, to demonstrate how we're exceeding Part L by 10%, in London by 35%, et cetera. So that flexibility hasn't been closed down. Now, there was talk of closing that down. Um, so obviously, be, please be aware of what your local plans are saying, et cetera, and what the drivers are going to be from the local authority. Okay, so this transitional process. So this is quite key to how we manage the flow from the current Partel to the new. So as I've already said, it's going to come into force. This new document will come into force this time next year. The documents themselves <coughs> should all be published just before Christmas. So some interesting read for us all over the Christmas break. And the transitional process will be by building, not site. So what does that actually mean? So if you get an initial notice in or you have a scheme with an initial notice in, you've registered your scheme with building control before the magic date of June 22, and you commence work on every building within that scheme by within the next 12 months, so you've got June 23, so you've started work, and by work, the definition at the moment is foundations, piling, or drainage, then you can build to the old, the current, okay, the current building regulations. If you do not start a building within that period, so you go over the June 23 position, that building will be assessed under new Part L under this document, which we're, re re we're reviewing today. And I hopefully you'll see, as I go through some of the sort of the, the headline details of what we need to do to get compliance for that position, that's gonna be quite challenging. You, you, you're gonna have a different strategy for that particular dwelling if you fall apart past that um, 12 month deadline. So yeah, it's quite crucial you understand this and obviously manage this into, into your programs to make sure you're not going to fall foul of this and change of rule. So historically, an initial notice, if you served an initial notice before a position of change of Part L, it would set that site, the complete number of units, if you've got two to 100, a thousand units within a scheme. So we are still doing SAP assessments on some of our larger jobs, which are still the old Part L, and the government's not comfortable with this. This is the reason why they've done that, because it takes such a long time to wash this through, to wash these changes of Part L, so we actually see the majority of the products. It takes multiple years to see the majority of the products come to, to come to market in these new Part L. And this whole agenda, 
Um, I should have mentioned that on the, the earlier slide. So the future home standards, um, the agenda at the moment is to do a, an uplift now. So we're going to have this uplift in June 22. Okay. So we're going to have this 31 carbon improvement next year come into force. And then by 2025, in the three years later, we're going to have another uplift taking the carbon saving to 75%. So we're net zero carbon ready. Okay, that's the position that the government's trying to get us in in the construction industry. So this is a first step of two quick steps. So we're going to have this one in 22, and then we're going to have another one that's going to come in in 25. So it's quite a big, where well, we haven't had a change of part L for multiple years, eight, nine, ten years. Now we're going to have two really quick ones. So just so you're aware. Okay, so what what's basically we're going to be looking at in terms of what we need to build out. What are these compliance matrix? So as I've already said, primary energy is the key matrix. This is the one the government is showing interest in. Um, and you'll hopefully you'll see by the end of the presentation why it does make sense. Okay. It's the marker which passive house is always used. Um, there is issues around counting carbon um, and I'll explain that again in a minute. But carbon's still going to be in there. There was in the original consultation talk of a affordability standard it's going to sit against the EPC. The government has backed away from that. Um, it wasn't specifically clear why, but it, it, it's not a clean matrix to pick. It's, it's slightly um, fudged and I, because it relates to fuel costs, is not alone the efficiency of the dwelling. So they've removed that. They brought the, the tiffy diffy back in. So anybody who's familiar with SAP calculations and reading them, etc., the fabric energy efficiencies returns. And then there is always the backstop minimum standards for fabric and um, fixed building services. So they're still in there, and there was washer in the SAP calculations. So the, as we're fairly familiar with them. Now because they brought the tiffy and diffy back. It wasn't consulted against in the original document. So this has been put into this future building standards. Okay. And there's the discussion of what that should look like, um, what those U values, et cetera, that's what it sets. It sets the U values and the air, air tightness. So there is some requirement there as well. Um, and again, I talked a little bit more detail in a couple of slides. And additional to all of this stuff, this sort of familiarity in terms of relying on the SAP calculations, building control within this document, within this new part L, will be expected to um, assess that the dwelling is future proof for zero carbon. Now, it's not very clear what that actually means, but that generally is making sure the house is adaptable. So as you change technology, so the, sim the, the most obvious one would be rip out a gas boiler and replace it with an air source heat pump is the infrastructure of that property appropriate for that change in apparatus the change from a gas boiler to an air source heat pump the issue with that switch over is an air source heat pump likes low temperature delivery it will it doesn't deliver the water around the properties for a central heating system at the same high temperatures as you would do a gas so consequently you need oversized rads or underfloor heating. So that would be sort of the strategy that building control would be looking for, um, just to make sure that the RADs or the heating, fundamentally the heating system is designed to be deemed low temperature delivery. Okay, so that's something which we will be starting to talk about. So what are we likely to be build, building out? Well, this is the notional specification. Now, when we do a SAP calculation, the SAP calculation is specific for that building. The targets are generated against the form of the building that you have designed. So we load all the details in, we load all the areas in, and what happens behind in the in the calculation is it says that's the form of the building, that's the area of the walls, that's the area of the roof, that's the area of the windows, and it compares it against this notional specification, the one on the screen now. So then that generates your target, okay? Then it then works out what the dwelling is. So fundamentally, what that means is you have to be around these figures. You have to build out somewhere near these figures. Now, some can be higher, but consequently, some need to be lower. But it's proportionate to the, the areas as well. So if you've got, a, if you fail on the wall U value, if your wall U value is high, obviously, 
a high proportion of the total heat loss area will come from the walls. So you're going to struggle a little bit. But doors, for example, there's only, you know, there's only obviously the main entrance door normally, etc. So the air, so you could be a little bit over on this one, but you have to compensate. So this specification gives you an idea of what we're going to build out for New Partel. Okay. So windows are down at 1.2. Now 1.2 is a good double glazed unit. It's not triple glazed. The documentations from the government generally say to start talking about double, um, triple glazing, etc. They're not really asking for it. We can work around it. So we see 1.2 um, double glazed units a lot. Okay. So that's okay. It's a little bit challenging. I'd say the norm would be 1.4, but 1.2 is is, is there. Doors one, which, as I said, um, they represent a small area of the whole scheme, so it's not particularly an issue. Um, there's some on the market is that, they're generally a little bit higher. Um, the big one, arguably, is walls. Okay, so we've got a, a wall U value in there of 0.18. That is beyond the norm of what we, we see at the moment. Um, you can do that with you know, you, you, then you start looking about cavity whips. Do you open up the cavity whips or do you use a full fill Kingspan product, um, et cetera? So this is, the, this is the one that's going to be a, a little bit more challenging. Obviously, if you decide that your strategy is open up the whips of the cavity, then your plot size is going to be bigger. Okay. And then this also, this is the crucial element I would argue at the moment is if, if you fail to work your transitional process correctly, if you fail to build out all your buildings under the old partel and suddenly you need to do the new, you're going to have a problem with this U values, okay, you, if you haven't already planned in the 0.18. Um, Within London, um, we the larger schemes are involved in, in London generally hit these U values because of the London plan. They're being asked to achieve a higher standard from the planners. So we are building to 0.18, okay, as a, as a general rule. Um, moving down, roofs, that's fairly normal. Floors are a little bit more aggressive, but not particularly uh, in, um, um, challenging. Air tightness of five, okay, that's the norm. That's what we see as our results coming in, in from site now, okay. I possibly would argue we're probably going to see that come down a little bit. I'd like to think we can start seeing threes. But, you know, that's kind of the norm. Party wall is zero. Then that's an anomaly within the, the, the methodology of SAP. That doesn't mean the party wall is technically going to perform as zero. It's a definition of what is a party wall should be made up of. That just means it's fully filled and sealed around the edges. So there's no chimney effect within the party wall. Um, so that's always been like that. So that's not a change at all. So just, you know, just to recap, the, the key ones there is definitely this wall. Um, it's more aggressive, and if you want to get below that, you, it's relatively challenging without open up a cavity, etc. To additional width, um, one, um, 100, 125, 150 cavities, etc. And obviously, you just need to make sure you're aware of the windows, and that may push up the cost of the windows. You can go for triple glazing. I'm, I'm not, I'm not arguing against triple glazing. So a good triple glazed unit would be um, 0.9, 0.8. Um, some are one, um, but they obviously it's an expense there, and and there's also the weight issues you need to be and the install on site issue as well. So that's where we're at. So all of this is in within the consultation, within that new consultation, the building standards. Um, but there was no reference to thermal bridging. So thermal bridging contributes to this as well. So the thermal bridging results which are the, the concentration of heat losses around junctions of a building, so it's corners, um, jams, lintels, et cetera, get in this mix. So if you end up with a good package of thermal bridging, you can arguably release a few of these U-values. Okay, so it's, it's always a compromise between all the, all the factors. Okay. Um, in the background of SAPs, the the, 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 the Notional building has changed slightly the lintels and the gable wall in terms of performance of the psi values. Okay, so if you enter these psi values, these are what you're competing against. You need to get down to this. Now, this lintel one's extremely challenging in my interpretation, and also the gable wall one, but it doesn't really depend. I wouldn't get too hung up on that at the moment, just so, just so you're aware. Now, 
within all this um, changes to the way we're doing the methodology of SAP, et cetera, and to satisfy this new Partel, the accredited construction details cannot be used. We will not be able to use those going forward. Now, if you, for those who are not familiar with what these are, there are a, a document that lists standard um, construction methods that the government created and you as develop, uh, designers, et cetera, could pick these off and say, this is what I'm going to use. We cannot use those that data anymore, that data set. The data sets we can use to demonstrate psi values, so whatever you're deciding to do within your building, are either going to be manufactured released results, so the block manufacturers have got some, timber frame guys have got some, etc. And if we deem there, uh, as a SAP assessor, if we deem they're appropriate and they look like they've been done correctly, then we can use their results, okay? Or alternatively, you get your own ones done. Um, so those are the, the, the really the only two sources of psi values, the, the thermal bridge injunction performance figures that we are, we will be able to use going forward. So they're trying to close that down a little bit and make it a little bit more robust, um, which kind of makes sense. So overall, the consultation is basically saying, the real key question for consultation, should there be a 15% allowance on this? Should the target be this plus 15%? Now, I suspect they'll say no, it will have to be somewhere around this. Now, this kind of makes sense to what we're trying to do. We're, you know, we're, we're on a roadmap now to get to net zero carbon for, 20, um, for 2030. I do get confused with the dates, I do apologize, but the government underlying strategy is to get to a position where our houses are ultimately zero carbon by 2050, okay? So, this kind of fits into the strategy, this high performance of the envelope, which we which we need to do. So we'll wait and see how that consultation comes out. I, it's closed, so it should be hopefully be published soon, but um, they've missed most of their dates on the last um, 18 months anyway. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about what the rest of the notional specification is, what, what the rest of the specification is within the SAP calculation that generates these targets, what we're competing against. So you put the fabric into the SAP calculation, it refers it against those notional U values, etc., which we just discussed. So then it gives you that element to it. Then you put in whatever heating system you deem you want to do. Okay, and then it then it generates the carbon numbers. It generates the carbon target as well. So your your DER, TER, fundamentally how it works. Now the notional specification that the government has published for this particular version of Partel is including a gas central heating system. The Daily Mail is quite keen on telling us you can't have gas heating anymore, um, etc. But you can. So they've designed it to be gas heated, okay? Um, uh, you know, it's a robust industry, the boilers are really efficient, etc. but they have included a number of toys to boost the result, okay? So it's gas heating plus other stuff. So the other stuff is quite interesting, well, it's for me anyway. Um, so first of all, you assume and you've got the fabric spec as we've just dis described. So you've got those 0.18 walls, etc. Then you need to add the notional, then add this in. So it's got a lot of photovoltaics on the roof. Okay. So we're generating electricity, um, and there's a calculation in there which works out what the notional PV will be. So you need to be there or thereabouts to 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 match that. They've included wastewater heat recovery from showers. So those guys, if you're not familiar with that kit, in effect, what it does is, as the shower is running, um, the, the warm water that's going down the waste pipe, there's a coil of water running around the side of it, which then runs around cold water that then goes back into the boiler or the hot water cylinder. And it's just a preheat of that water, the cold supply water, which will then be turned into hot water, okay? And then, the other criteria that they've included is a max, maximum operating temperature of 55 degrees for the heating system itself, okay? So this is this low temperature design strategy. So this would end up with a situation, this would give you a benefit within the calculation. You defined it as being future-proof because it's low energy. And consequently, um, 
you will end up with a, a, pro a property with oversized rads, et cetera, or, or underfloor heating. So that's the key strategy. So if you build to this and you, you hit those U values, you're going to deliver um, on new Partel. But the interesting one here is this somewhat strange calculation they've invented for photovoltaic. So we've always had this problem going back into the cove stable homes, et cetera, years ago. We were, you know, we were supposed to be building zero carbon homes in 2016. And always the problem was to get a net zero carbon, a zero carbon dwelling at that time, you needed so much photovoltaics on the roof, it wouldn't fit, okay? Now, a SAP calculation does all its, all its results are demonstrated against the total floor area of the dwelling, which obviously makes total sense. So it's the total area of the conditioned space of that property, what's heated. Unfortunately, that doesn't work out very well when we start talking about photovoltaics because obviously multiple floor buildings, townhouses, etc., have a relatively small roof area. So they've invented this calculation. So if I just concentrate on the houses first, it's slightly even more complicated for the flats. So the amount of photovoltaics on the roof you need is point, just over 0.6 of the ground floor area. So it's great. It's not, it's not a true calculation. When you start looking at flats, it also includes the number of stories. So it's reducing the amount of PV within this notional, okay, because it understands you can't physically get it on the roof. So down at the bottom here, I've got two examples of what that actually means. There's so three big, three bed semi, ground floor area of 45 square meters, okay. So that works out with this calculation. You need 2.8 kilowatt peaks of photovoltaics on the roof. So that works through, depending on the efficiency of the panels, about 15 square meters, that's a lot. You know, we don't normally put that much on a property at the moment, even when there's a, a, a relatively aggressive planning condition. Then moving on to the next one, I've got a four bed detached. This one's got a ground floor area of 65 square meters. That washes through to the amount of PV being four kilowatt peak, and that's just over 20 square meters. Okay, so that kind of loosely makes sense, bigger property, etc. But the reality is, this is a townhouse. This is three stories. So the total floor areas of these properties are the same. Okay, this is the, the four beds only over two stories. So we've got quite a difference in the amount of PV within the notional. So it's going to be advantageous in some respects to not have a lot of ground floor areas. Um, so I'm not quite sure how they're going to police this, how we're going to, how it will be tailored within SAP. The final documents aren't available at the moment, which is quite frustrating. So, but you can imagine an integral garage is going to make your dwellings easier to get compliance if you go for this type of strategy, okay? Because you're going to drop out some of the floor area if this is the definition they're going to follow. And consequently, you're going to have less photovoltaics. So, so your cost per square meter will be advantageously cheaper um, for a townhouse. Um, flats over garages is another interesting one. Are we are going to be allowed just to use that ground floor area where the entrance is? Um, if so, you, will virtually, you won't really need any photovoltaics for this to work. So they've created a, quite an anomaly here, which I'm not quite sure they fully understand, but I, can, I kind of understand how they've got themselves into this position because it's been a repeat problem we, we've been discussing for multiple years. So I've just put this in there because there is some confusion within the documents. Anybody who's out there looking at these documents, please be careful because the, consult the original consultation, um, the response to the consultation, and there's some variations between the draft SAP documents as well about this particular definition. Some say floor lowest um, story floor area, and some don't. Um, so some are inferring you use the total floor area of the dwelling. So there is a, there is an oddity out there. So I'll, I'll just flag that up just so you're aware. So this is the clarification which is coming in SAP, um, SAP 10.2, which we've had clarified by, by government just to make sure we're we're looking at the right one. And all you know, and also please be aware that all this notional specification is assuming a, a, a good orientation. Okay, so. Going back to those results, you know, this is assuming a good orientation as well, so it's matching. 
But if you have got a property which can't be orientated in the best way, so it hasn't got any uh, reference to south, it's, it's just an east or a west, um, then you're going to have a problem. You're going to need more photovoltaic to make this work on your particular dwelling. You're going to have to exceed the notional by some way. So it is it is doable gas central heating. Okay, it's definitely you can carry on with this strategy um, for this uplift, um, but it is going to be more challenging. Um, and you will get variations between plots. So you've got the same dwelling type, but if you've got slight, you're obviously going to have different orientations as you go around the site. If it's a large scheme, then you're going to have quite varying strategies internally to make it work. Now these aren't the only toys you can add. You know, there's there's a vast uh, myriad of different apparatus you can include in there, which will which could compensate. So if you're not happy with wastewater heat recovery, you could look at other strategies. Um, MVHR um, will help, um, you know, increasing the controls, etc. There's a number of different elements in there which smaller will give us some small improvements. So it's not, this isn't a given. You need to do this, um, and you can have a, you could in, improve the U values, etc. Beyond the notional, what we just talked about on the previous slide. So you could drop out some of these elements. So there's, there's a number of different ways of managing this, but this gives you an illustration of the, the, the target, the challenge that we, we've got going um, to go forward. So I'll just, just put some calculations here. Don't, don't, don't get bogged down in this too much. But um, so I've, all we've done here is we've built the notional against um, the current SAP tool, okay, for those two dwellings which we um, illustrated on the other page. So this is the carbon numbers which we see. So if we were to build to the current regs um, with those U values and the, the, the apparatus within the building, this is the sort of figures you're getting in terms of carbon savings. So it's massive. It's a massive uplift to what we're doing at the moment. So uh, you know, near 70%, over 80% over carbon saving. But this is the energy number. Okay, we don't. We're not used to this. So the energy number is showing a, a 40. You know, around 40% improvement for both. Um, so straight away, you know, you can see the energy is going to be the challenge. It's not necessarily the carbon. The carbon sort of let, works itself through. It's going to be this energy number. Then I've repeated that with some of the demonstration software which we've got. Okay, so there's a number of different SAP 10 demonst demonstrators out there at the moment. Ours included, FSAP Beta, FSAP Tan Beta from Stroma. Um, it's available for download. Um, done a bit of pitch there, that was very good. And um, as you can see here, we get compliance with that specification. It's going over the top somewhat. Now, we've, you know, a number of the different software tools um, are not compliant as yet. They haven't been tested by the BRE. The BRE haven't issued their compliance documentation. So, what they do is they do a load of example dwellings. Which we then tune and make sure we've got no errors in the SAP. None of that's been available yet. So, so please be aware: all these SAP 10 tools that are out there are only demos, and they've not they've got no current accreditation against them. But you can see again, you know, that the the, the energies work quite nicely there, and this strategy. Okay. Now, I'm throwing in another another element here. So, the EPC rating. For this particular dwelling, okay, this notional dwelling, which I've built up to match the notional in the document, is gas heated, and these achieve an A rating in um, EPC. Um, um, so just so you're aware, what I've done now is I've I've taken away, I've got the same buildings, okay. What I've done is I've got the U values exactly as I need to to, to get compliance with the Tiffy Diffy, so those same U value performance. But I've taken away all the toys and the heating system and replaced it with an air source heat pump. Okay. So all this dwelling is going to be is better fabric, 0.18 of a wall, no toys, nothing on the roof, no photovoltaics, an air source heat pump delivering 100% of the water heating and space heating, okay, throughout the year. And these are the results we get. So in terms of the carbon, we get massive improvements in the carbon. So it works really nicely on the carbon. So it's easily compliant, okay, way, way compliant. Then we move to the energy. So on the first one, we're around 
just compliant, well, easily compliant, 17%. On the second one, the bigger property, it's not. It's just failing marginally. Okay. Now, the issue going forward with it, well, there's a number of issues with air source heat pumps going forward, but in terms of the compliance and what we need to do, uh, I'm talking as a SAP assessor, um, as, a, as part of the industry, which is going to um, demonstrate compliance with this, is the air source heat pump industry is not as, um, what's the word, not stable, but it's not as, doesn't have the history and it's not as um, settled as the gas boiler industry. Gas boilers are fundamentally very good bits of kit and generally they all have a very much the same performance criteria. They all have the same efficiencies. Okay? There's not a lot of difference between them. Heat pumps is, is a completely, is a, is a relatively new market for the UK and is a va varied performance range. So you could come to us with a strategy and it looks good on the tin, but once we ask you that question, what heat pump are you using? If you've picked the bad one, it will fail, okay? There are a number of good ones out there on the market which will demonstrate compliance. Now, I haven't roughly gone through all this, but this is just really to demonstrate this. It's the same heat pump being used in these two properties. There is the other problem, which you need to tailor the heat pump to the size of the property, to the heat loss of the property, okay? So it's quite crucial. So you do need some support there. We are, I don't pretend, I think as an industry, as a SAP side, you know, it's, it's relatively new to us. We don't, we've, we do do heat pumps historically under current part L, but it's something to be aware of. Please make sure that any time you're specking a heat pump strategy, make sure you get a good piece of kit, okay. Now, the EPC ratings for this compliant strategy, which looks very good, drops, okay. The EPC rating is something which, again, as a subset, we haven't, we don't generally show much interest because it doesn't drive compliance. It's not part of the compliance matrix for, for Part L, but it's obviously crucial for um, the end user, stroke the landlord, etc. Now, the reason why it's dropping is because the EPC rating, that that certificate with a big A, B, C on the front and all those that little. Um, graph is a function of the efficiency of the dwelling times the fuel cost you're using and the problem is is electricity in this country is expensive okay so it's not saying that this dwelling isn't efficient it arguably is it's just going to cost you more to run and that is a consequence of this strategy if you go for air source heat pumps which is the ultimate goal of you know the changes to part L is the ultimate goal to remove gas from properties then the way the market is at the moment of electricity um electricity is 14 15 16 p a kilowatt whereas gas is four or five p a kilowatt so there's a disparity in the cost structure and that is going to cause somewhat of a problem part of the reason why there's a disparity is that most all the green tax elements against energy the uh, you know the funding for offshore wind etc is loaded on the electricity cost okay um, but yeah so whether that changes in the future obviously it will be interesting to see so but obviously what also you need to just take away from this that this is the the key compliant the two key compliance for new part out is definitely going to be make sure you hit the fabric you're going to have to hit the tiffy diffy then you need to manage your energy consumption. Um, and an air source heat pump um, is, is naturally able to manage energy. It's, what happens with an air source heat pump is generally, it's, it's the same process as a fridge, okay? If you touch the back of your fridge, it's warm. We're just reversing the process. So the technology is not new. So in effect, what it does is it takes one unit of electricity in there, into the pump, into the cycle of the, of the air source heat pump and it compresses three units of useful energy from the air outside okay so it takes energy out of the air it compresses it to deliver a useful heat and delivers it to the property so the energy ratio of three to one is fantastic that's why these energy numbers are work very well so that's the strategy which we will be going to and i hopefully you've guessed 
now I'm talking about next year, but come 2025, when we need to get to a 75% carbon saving, another big uplift, bigger than what we're doing at the moment, then air source heat pumps are, have got to be part of the mix. Gas won't work, okay. Um, I've kind of already gone through a little bit of that with the EPC stuff for the first bit there, but fundamentally that's just to repeat what I just said about the costings of the fuel. So why, what, what else is going on with SAP10? So they, so we've got the consequential effect of the EPC. Um, the EPC ratings won't look as good as, they, as we were familiar, but another consequential change to um, that's going to come through the wash is the fact that the carbon factors are changing for grid electricity. Okay, so what do I mean by carbon factors? So when we do the energy calculations, the, the SAT tool understands how much energy is required to do the space heating, water heating, etc., for an annual cycle. It looks at that energy consumption for, say, heating, said so there's so many kilowatt hours. Right, what's the fuel? Right, the fuel for that is gas. So it times the carbon factor for gas against those kilowatt hours for the year to work out the total emissions, the total carbon emissions that you are going to emit from that property to, to run the boiler to do that. Now gas in a boiler is a chemical reaction and our gas from the North Sea, et cetera, has a certain ratio of carbon that's going to be emitted. So in this case, it's 0 0.519 kilowatts per kilowatt, um, kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. I'm sorry, no, that's actually wrong. Uh, um, this gas is 0.21. Um, but the grid electricity is somewhat more complicated. Okay, So the grid electricity carbon factor, so every time you turn on a switch, how much carbon is being emitted by the generation of that electricity, that changes. It's not a, a set number as gases. It's not a chemical reaction as gases. It changes with the national grid mix. Now this is a great story. So you know, historically we've had lots of power stations burning coal, gas, oil, etc., to deliver our, our um, electricity. But those are being phased out. Um, you know, month by month, the carbon factor, the, the total carbon emissions per kilowatt hour for our national grid is improving. Okay. So we only ever really wash this through into SAP, into Part L calculations when we do changes. So there's going to be a reduction in the carbon factors from 0.519 down to 0.136. That's what they're publicized at the moment. This may get better by the time they get the documents out. Hopefully it will. So you can see it's collapsed. Okay. So where it was twice as bad as gas before, the carbon factor for the electricity is dropping down to this position. So it's better. It's a cleaner fuel than gas. And gas is relatively for a um, a combustion exercise is relatively clean. Um, it's a lot cleaner than oil, etc. So this is a brilliant story. Now this is, just, you know, just basically due to the fact we've changed the mix in what we're doing. So this graph sort of tries to illustrate that, and I hope it makes sense. So this is the carbon factor intensity of our national grid. So the grid electricity. This is the this orange line here is the prediction going forward of what's happening to the carbon intensity of the national grid. So this line is continuously dropping as more renewables come online and we're able to remove the dirtier elements of the, the mix. So we're closing more coal. I think most of the coal's gone already anyway. And we'll start removing some of the gas generation of electricity um, and supplementing that with more off, off pure wind, photovoltaics. There's obviously a little bit of nuclear in there, which is deemed to be um, carbon neutral as well. So this is what, all of this is what we're talking about in this presentation. Partel is trying to take advantage of this line, okay? We are programmed to try and get to net zero carbon ready. Now, it seems a strange definition of what we should be doing. What does that actually mean? Well, basically what it's saying is we need to get buildings off mains gas and into a position where they can have space and water heating, the high consumption elements of energy from electricity. By doing that, you take advantage of this. So 
over time, if you build, if you get a building with an air source heat pump built in 2022, it's going to naturally improve its carbon intensity as the national grid improves. The other figures, you know, gas is a, is a chemical reaction, so it's, it's stuck on this on this line. Okay, um, this is where they originally defined SAT 10 when the consultation was written, but it looks like they're going to drop it even to lower. This is where we are at the moment with electricity. It's up in this position. So hopefully that illustrates why we are doing this. Okay, why we are trying to get away from gas and get into this position. So. Part L over the next two changes is going to do two things. It's going to make a step change in the fabric. So we have to consume less energy. So there's that goal as well. And then the next thing is it's trying to force the switch out from gas to electricity. We're going to be able to do gas in the next uplift, but we're not going to be able to really go forward, carry on with that. Okay. Um, and again, hopefully that makes sense. So, you know, the, the, you, you read, uh, there was a month uh, during one of the COVID lockdown periods where we had no coal or gas fast um, power stations operating for a reasonable period. So the carbon factors were lower than this prediction, uh, uh, quite dramatically lower. So it is a really good story and it's something that which doesn't really get publicized very much but that's what we're trying to do that's what the goal of this these two changes in part L. and hopefully you can see that's why we're moving away from a carbon number as a key matrix to energy so it kind of loosely makes sense because the energy the carbon number is going to vary anyway but the energy is proportional to what you're building it's not going to be proportional to you what you're building plus what the national grid is doing okay so hopefully that makes sense right what else do we need to do on site so there's a perception um that there's a performance gap between what we build what we are doing on on site and what is actually comes through in the energy bills for the residents for the people we sell the properties to the performance gap so the epc says one thing the reality is, is different when somebody moves in. And there's three measures that the government is intending to implement, which is um, a bit of a step change for us all. The first one is 100% air testing. So currently, Strom is one of the biggest air testing organizations in the country. We've got guys running around in vans everywhere. We generally do 100% air testing now. We don't do sample testing. It's, you know, the cost for us to do an air test is the guy to get to site, really. Um, so if he's at site, he may as well do four, five, six dwellings in one hit and then leave rather than just do sample. It doesn't make sense. And you get ping lights for doing sampling as well. So that's not a big uplift, but you will have to, it will be enforced. The second one is a big change. So as a subassessor, we have to collect audit information on each job. So we would expect to get a, a collection of data back to confirm what you've done, what you've built on site, that you've you've built as promised, you're hitting those U values, et cetera. The government wants to take this further and wants to have photographic evidence of what you've built. So that means we want to see photographic evidence of the installs of installation. So whether that's in the slab, in the walls, up in the roof, we need to see photographic evidence come back to us as a SAP assessor before we can sign it off. And that needs to be per plot, not per site, per plot. We want to see the heating system, the ventilation system, any renewables, and we want to see photographic evidence of any key junctions. So what they're talking about here is the thermal bridging detailing, what you're doing around the jams, lintels, etc. So that all needs to be documented. And then the final bit is they want a standardized home user guide to be produced for each property. And within that, it's going to collate those photographic evidence. So when the person moves in, they can open up the document and see what type of floor information, floor insulation they've got, etc. So it's a proper documented proof of what's gone into their build. So going forward, if they make any amendments to the design of the house, the extension, etc., there's a reference to what there is in there as well. Okay, so it's a big change for us, and we're, I must confess we're quite nervous about it. Um, as a software provider, we have a, what we're proposing to do with the FSAPS software is have some 
linked to site to the job file etc where the site team can take these appropriate photographs okay and it will automatically upload into the SAT tool we're going to need to do that because it's quite it's going to be quite data heavy um, and then we will be able to deliver on the back of the SAT tool a home user guide to the standardized format so we'll put the standardized format and it will self populate the photographs etc that's the proposal which we're looking at at the moment which we're working up okay to try and manage this but there's obviously quite a lot of data there and we're slightly nervous about driving the site activity to take the photographs because they've got to be done at multiple times during a build of each plot that's the, the, the key thing is, is per plot so it's going to be somewhat challenging okay right so this is the you're probably pleased to hear this is the last slide um, I'm going slightly off part L now um, just wanted to highlight another element which is in this future building standard so this is the one that we went out to consultation um, which we're waiting on the response for and we are going to have a new approved document for overheating. Overheating historically has been loosely dealt with within Partel. There's a little bit of it in SAP, and if I'm honest, it's not very robust, and the majority of SAP assessors will fudge it to make it work, okay? This is not a particularly aggressive methodology. Now, overheating is going to be a ongoing problem within dwellings. As you see, we're going to be thermally improving them, um, and the climate is going to get warmer. Yeah. Um, so there is a concern reference to living conditions within hot buildings, and it is documented, World Health Organization, etc., that if you're if you um, live within a building which has excessive temperatures over repeat nights, which is the main key issue, it is extremely detrimental to your health. If you have warm evenings and warm nights, that mean you can't sleep very well night after night. It's, it's quite documented that you, you are in, it can be quite serious, especially for the elderly and the young. Um, there's been a notable um, um, studies done on some um, sort of clusters of deaths um, in Paris, etc., over some hot periods. So the government is going to introduce a new approved document, standalone document to address this issue, to make sure we design robust buildings going forward. The proposal at the moment is to have two different dwelling types. Type A, which is cross ventilation, etc., is fundamentally houses, and type B is going to be flat, so there's less opportunity for cross ventilation, etc. Then they're going to divide the country into two, so there's England and Greater London. So they deem Greater London to have the bigger issue. So every urban area does have a higher um, higher base load temperature it's from the sort of the urban heat heat island effect it does make um, dense urban areas warmer. But at the moment they're concentrating on London as being the worst case. Then there's going to be two routes for compliance. There's going to be a simplified method or a dynamic method. The simplified method is just looking at maximum glaze areas to floor areas. So outside of London, you can have the glazing area for your dwelling needs to be controlled to 21% um, of the total floor area or under. Okay. Um, well, currently within the calculations, it like it does some other background things to do with within SAP to do with um, glazing areas. The magic number was always 25%. So they've dropped it a little bit. So I think, you know, ultimately that will be less than you'll be familiar with in terms of total glazing. In London, that areas are going to come down quite a bit. So it's 13% for houses and 15% flats. Um, and within London, you need to make sure the transitional factors of the glazing are a little bit lower than normal, et cetera, and it encourages some shading. It's, it's just a little bit more aggressive within London. The alternative is to go to the dynamic simulation method um, to actually do a full thermal model for your dwelling. Okay. And that brings into play T, um, SIBC TM59 assessment which is quite an aggressive tool so what would we do that we do these assessments um, we're doing for large schemes in London etc so what you basically do is you do a full model um, and you run the climatic conditions across it 
um, for a simulation tool. So we use IES, TAS, et cetera, as a number on the market. So in a, what we're able to do is we can then run the weather um, during the summer months over the property and it investigates the internal temperatures of all the rooms. If these internal temperatures have a high percentage that exceed the thresholds, then it's deemed to be an issue. Now, the problem I've got with TM59 is it generally was designed as a risk assessment. Um, so it just demonstrate what your risks were. And we're, we're switching it over, and we've done that already with planning. We're switching it over to a compliance tool. So it was never really perceived as that, as an aggressive compliance tool. So it's quite a difficult one to work with. So what the key element is, you can't allow the bedrooms um, to run repeat nights at 26 degrees or above in terms of temperature, internal temperature. So it's a, it's a tricky one to work with. Um, and consequently, you know, if you can get away with a simplified method, then that is obviously a more straightforward way of doing it. Within the SAP tool, what I think we're going to do is we will have a marker whether you have complied with the SAP uh, compliance method. Whether that would be a document which was satisfied building control, I'm not sure at the moment, until the consultation is complete. But we will put a marker in whether you have passed the simplified overheating criteria. If not, then you'd have to then move on to look at TM59. Um, but really, you know, ultimately what you're doing with summer overheating is you don't want to overglaze a dwelling. That's the first rule, which we do love, especially in part apartments in, in cities. We love to overglaze them. And whatever you glazing area you've got, you need to make it openable. Okay. We don't overheating assessments and the, the, the reality of overheating is if you've got fixed panes of any area that you can't open then you're going to have a problem ideally you want to put shading on the external elements of a building that works really well for obvious reasons but if you're not comfortable with doing that in terms of your design integral blinds within the double glaze units so that can be controlled, which are fixed within the within the unit of, of the glazing are brilliant. They work really well as well. So that's a nice strategy for compliance. Internal blinds don't really do a lot. The heat's already got in. It's already got in and starts bouncing around in time inside the dwelling. So you've still got that problem. So it's just one to be aware of. Um, but again, you know, one of the, the other key criteria of all of this the, the whole element of this change to part out and this new one of summer overheating. If you're able to standardize your product, um, if you're a mass house builder or you've got a portfolio of dwellings, then you are going to have an advantage going forward in terms of what you're delivering on site. If you've got standard products, you're going to hit this overheating because you understand what it is and you're controlling your glazing areas. And if you want to overglaze and you, you, you do a TM59 and, and work, work it through aggressively so you know you've got a standard product. The Partel, if you've got a, a reasonable fixed product, you know what your fabric's going to be. You know what your thermal bridging is going to be because you've, you're probably going to get them calculated would be my advice to do that. You know what air source heat pumps you're going to put in there and you've got a product which is going to deliver you compliance with confidence. Ultimately, if you want to stick with a gas boiler, you're going to have to do some more work on your standardized product and you're going to have to make sure you cover all eventualities in terms of orientation. But again, you can do it. But it's going to this this document, this part out and this summer overheating is going to drive the standardization in terms of what we deliver on site. OK, in my, my opinion, anyway. OK, I think I've finished. You'd be pleased to know. Has anyone Thanks, done? Mandy. Thank you. Um, so I know questions have come in, but I'm unable to get into my questions tab for some reason. It is not letting me open it up properly. So what I will need to do um, is send them over to you separately via email. OK, yeah, no problem at all. Yeah. Yeah, if that's all okay. right. And then I can obviously email out the responses to the people that have asked the questions. OK. No okay. Problem. Um, so just quickly then, um, just a couple of things to mention from here is just to keep an eye on our upcoming training courses. So keep your eyes peeled on the website. 
and also the Built Environment Awards deadline was extended to the end of June. Obviously, that is also very quickly approaching. So if you are interested in submitting or have any questions, please do get in touch with me. Um, I just want to thank Andy for doing that presentation for us this morning and thank everybody for joining us. Our next webinar is on the 14th of July, and that is with Joss Burton. Um, is the world making good use of you is the title for that one. Um, so again, thank you to Andy. Thank you to everyone for joining. Hopefully I'll see you all online again soon, and I will get those questions answered and sent out as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. See you again.